I'm honored to welcome our closing keynote. You're about to hear an amazing speaker who not only owns his own business, but is a published author and has been on the 30 under 30 list for both Inc. and Forbes. In his book, The Creative Curve, he overturns the myth surrounding the theme of creative genius and reveals the science behind achieving breakout success in any field. His Twitter and Instagram handles are at Allen, just at Allen. He's like the Cher and Madonna of social media. He's also an avid fan of Taylor Swift and loves corgis. During his presentation, Alan Gannett, founder and CEO of Track Maven, will share and disprove how creativity really happens and how you can leverage it to have more aha moments. We're thrilled to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Alan Gannett. Hello! How are you guys? Good. Friday afternoon in wonderful San Diego. It's great. Um, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to talk about creativity, which is a good topic to end a conference like this on. Um, before we get started, if you want, after we're done, uh, feel free to send me an email. This is a giant picture of my face. Um, if you have any questions, happy to dig in. And by the way, I know you're wondering it. I'm not 12, I'm 11, so <laughs> thank you, though, for holding it in. So we're going to be talking about creativity, and creativity is one of those topics that we all sort of think we know what it means, right? We've read those Fast Company articles and those entrepreneur cover stories and all this stuff, but there's something weird at work when it comes to creativity. Like, for some reason, when I throw paint on a canvas, it's not worth anything, but when Jackson Pollock did, it was. Right? What's going on there? There's something richer at work. But there's some people in our culture who are so damn good at this. Hit after hit, product after product, they're able to create these amazing things. These creative geniuses are people who we hold in high esteem. So who are some creative geniuses you guys can name? I want you just to shout it out. Beyonce? She's always the first answer. I don't know why. Seriously. Michael Jackson, Steve Jobs, Josh Miles, look at you. So you guys have, that was pretty eclectic, good job. Um, these are the most common answers I get. You know, we have Einstein, we have Elon Musk, although these days a little weird. Um, Oprah, we have on the top right, we have Mozart, our sort of cliche child prodigy on the bottom right. We have Beethoven looking super creepy. And by the way, no one ever mentions my personal favorite, Taylor Swift, which is OK, because you know she doesn't have flaws, but you guys do. So <laughs> it's cool. So what's interesting to me about creative genius is that in Western culture, creativity and creative genius go hand in hand. Right? We don't talk about creativity without talking about these people who are just so darn good at it. And the stories of creative genius all have a very similar arc. Let me give you an example. Paul McCartney, the number one songwriter of number one singles, including the number one most recorded song of all time, Yesterday. But when you hear the story of how he came up with Yesterday, he literally says that he woke up with it from a dream. He says, I woke up one morning with a tune in my head and thought, hey, I don't know this tune. Or do I? He literally was so worried that he had maybe accidentally plagiarized it that for two weeks he went around to his friends and like would hum it for them and was like, um, have you heard this before? And they were like, no, Paul. And he's like, are you sure? And they're like, yes. Um, and a little fun fact for you, during this little process of sort of paranoid uh, playing, someone offered him scrambled eggs and so he used his placeholder lyrics. This is true. These are the placeholder lyrics for the song Yesterday. And I will sing it for you if you promise to applause. Is that a yes? OK, OK. Ready? Scrambled eggs. Oh, my baby, how I love your eggs. Did a little, I believe in scrambled eggs. Thank you, I know. San Diego's got talent. So what's interesting to me about these stories of creative genius is that they all have this moment, 
this flash of genius where suddenly it becomes clear, where suddenly these creative greats have these amazing ideas and epiphanies seemingly in a second. And this is part of what I call the inspiration theory of creativity. It's the main way we think about creativity in Western culture. It has four key elements. The first, it's individual centric. Right, we talk about Steve Jobs, we talk about Elon Musk, we talk about Taylor Swift, we talk about the individual. Second, for these people it's easy, right? They're not struggling to come up with ideas, they like roll out of bed with them, literally. Third, it can often be overwhelming. So we talk about getting into the flow, we use an electricity analogy to talk about this. And fourth and finally, these people are all kind of weird. Right, like have you seen Elon Musk's Twitter recently? Like it's strange. You know, Mozart was a neurotic. Um, we talk about Steve Jobs being a jerk. Like there's a little bit something different to these people. But there's also a fifth thing. It's also unattainable. This is the story of the haves and the have nots. Of us normies and these creative demigods who seemingly just have these amazing ideas out of nowhere. Adobe did a study and they found that only 25% of us think we're living up to our creative potential. And I was looking at a book on like presentations and they said you should use a lot of puppy and baby photos. And so I think there's a good place for a token picture of a sad puppy because that's pretty depressing. <laughs> I know. By the way, I have a corgi and this isn't my corgi because my corgi is never sad. So just <laughs> FYI. So the question that I want to investigate is what if this isn't true? What if this idea of creativity that we talk about in our culture, that we put on magazine covers, what if that's not really how it works? So I want to look at it in three ways. One, the history of creativity and the stories we tell ourselves. Two, the science of creativity, what we can learn from neuroscience, psychology. And then three, what do the actual creative greats in our culture, what do they say? And so for the book, I interviewed 25 living creative greats. So this is everyone from like, Pasek and Paul, the songwriting duo who did Dear Evan Hansen, La La Land, and The Greatest Showman. Uh, Brenda Chapman, the first woman to win the Oscar for Best Animated Film. Uh, David Rubenstein, The Billionaire. And I put those interviews together and came up with a few patterns I found of things they did. And so I want to share some of that with you guys today. But I want to start by re-examining some of the history around creativity. Because these stories of creative genius, well, there's more than meets the eye. Let's talk about Mozart. So who here has seen the movie Amadeus? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. OK. So that's a lot of people. Um, so Amadeus won eight Academy Awards. So if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, at the time, it did $220 million in the box office, which is $660 million inflation adjusted. And I just gave this talk in can Canada. And I was like, that's like a billion Canadian. They got really offended. <laughs> So like, don't make currency jokes, apparently. But anyway, it is like a billion Canadian if you do the math. <laughs> I'm stubborn. So anyway, in this movie, Mozart um, is portrayed, the opening scene is Mozart as three years old, blindfolded playing the piano for the Pope. Like, that's the opening scene. And the narrator is Salieri, his arch nemesis composer who kills him eventually, spoiler, and he goes, OK, Mozart. You know, at the age of four, wrote his first concerto. At the age of six, wrote his first opera. He never made second drafts. It was like the voice of God coming out of this kid. And this is the story of Mozart that we have, that he's this child prodigy. In fact, when you start working on a book about creativity, people will go, well, what about Mozart? Well, what about Mozart? Mozart is by far one of the most embellished stories of creative genius there is. So here's the real Mozart story. Are you ready? OK. So Mozart had what we would all call a helicopter dad. And Mozart's helicopter dad, when he was three years old, said, little Mozart? And little Mozart was like, yes, dad. Um, I love you, but, which you should never do to a kid. Conditional love is bad. Um, <laughs> I love you, mom. I love you, but, you know, you really need to become a great musician. And little Mozart's like, whatever you say, dad, I'm three. And Mozart's dad hired for him the best music teachers in all of Europe and started making little Mozart practice three hours, seven days a week. 
He then did not write his first concerto at four, that's made up. He didn't write an opera at six, that's made up. We thought we found a piece of music he wrote at 11. It turns out it was plagiarized, oops. His first truly original piece of music that he wrote was when he was 17. And you might be like, oh, that's pretty impressive. Except one, it's not very good. Like it's on Spotify, thumbs down. Two, two, this is after 14 years of practicing three hours, seven days a week with the best music teachers in all of Europe under the conditional love of a helicopter dad. Like you too could write a half decent concerto. So this idea of Mozart is just sort of comical. In fact, the idea that he never had second drafts, it comes from a letter that was published in 1815 in a music magazine, apparently from Mozart describing his composition process. And that article, that letter, hashtag fake news. It was forged by the magazine publisher to sell copies. Oh, by the way, we're not done. His name, not even Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. That was a stage name. It's all a lie. So Mozart, Mozart is a particularly egregious example of this. But what you find when you actually look closer at the stories of creative genius is over and over again, they're the stories of historical games of telephone. They're embellished. They're oversold, they're overmarketed, and they're not delivered. But then what if you look at the science of creativity? So in the book, I have a bunch of studies that I talk about, but I want to give you one little example I think is really useful. Because the short version is the research does not support the idea of the inspiration theory of creativity at all. In fact, quite the opposite. So let me give you an example. We're going to go to Austria, Sound of Music Land, and in Austria, these researchers had a basic question. What would happen if you compare IQ to creativity? Right, because the higher your IQ, the more creative you should be. So they had everyone do a test, an IQ test and a creativity test, and IQ is normalized on a bell curve. So if you have an IQ of 100, like half the world's smarter than you, half the world's less smart. Everyone here is on the right side. Good job. They paid me to say that, literally. And so what you find when you compare IQ to creativity is that actually there is a correlation, but only up to a threshold of 104. Once you get to a threshold of 104, the correlation goes away. You get an IQ of 110 or an IQ of 160. It doesn't matter. You have the same creative potential. So that's not a dozen people. That's not 100 people. That's not even thousands of people. That is billions and billions of people with the same creative potential. So this is called the threshold theory. It's been replicated in a lot of studies. And the question that it presents for us is how can we unlock that? Right, if we all have that creative potential, well then why is there such a gap between creative potential and creative achievement? And can we close that? So I wanna talk about how we can close that gap. And I wanna give you guys three things you can start doing this weekend to actually start closing that gap. And we're going to start by telling a story. And this story takes place in Phoenix, Arizona. Is anyone from Phoenix? Woo, good luck. Um, some dry heat. And this story is kind of weird, because it takes place in somewhere that I had to Google. Like, I didn't know what this thing was. It's called a video rental store. And it's like an offline Netflix. So like, you walk around the shelves. And they're like menus on a website. Very weird. And at this video rental store thing, there was an 18-year-old named Ted who was the clerk. And he was a community college student. This was sort of a side gig. And he's the protagonist of our story. And the reason why he's the protagonist of our story is that for some reason, every day at 5 PM, when people came home from work, they would line up to talk to Ted. Because this 18-year-old kid had cultural awareness. He had taste. He had this amazing ability to recommend movies. If you liked Woody Allen, he's like, well, how about Albert Brooks? If you like this action movie, how about that action movie? He was like this film sommelier at 18. But why? Well, like a lot of things, it's kind of Freudian. So it starts with childhood. He was the first of five siblings. His parents had him when they were teenagers. They were kind of poor. They lived in a two-bedroom. And the house was always chaotic. 
And so to get away, he would go escape to his grandmother's house. And I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you what you get when you Google image grandmother's living room. <laughs> it's great. But this story doesn't take place in 1965, so just suspend disbelief. It's 1985. And Ted would go to his grandmother's house, and his grandmother was one of these ladies who just loved Hollywood. Like, she always had the TV on. She was always watching shows and movies. She had all the star magazines sort of strewn across the coffee table. She would talk about actors and actresses with their first names, like they were former lovers and flames. And so for Ted, this place felt safe. He could get away from the chaos of home. And so he fell in love with movies. He fell in love with entertainment. And so when this video rental store thing opened down the street, he walked in and started talking to the owner. The owner was like, damn, this kid's weird. And he hired him on the spot. And Ted, you know, being the, the kid that he was, he probably should have been studying to get into Arizona State. But instead, what he did was saying, OK, video rental stores are empty during the day. There's no one renting movies during the workday. I have this big video store to myself. I know. I should watch every single movie in the store. And I don't mean this hyperbolically, like he literally watched every single movie in the store. And there were less movies then, but still a lot of movies. And the result was he had developed this amazing ability to understand what was out there. What had people seen before? What had they not seen? He developed taste. And this has served him very well. For the last 18 years, he's been the chief content officer of Netflix, where he's overseen all original programming, all content licensing. This year, they're spending $7 billion with a B on programming and producing 700 original shows. That's not episodes, that's shows. And he's one of the people I interviewed. And what I thought was so interesting about him, he was a sort of an early interview in the process, was that he identified for me this pattern where we think of creatives almost in opposition to consumers. There's this social media meme you might have seen that's like, 90% of people consume, 9% engage, 1% create, hashtag hustle, hashtag Gary V. Like, it's kind of stupid. And the reality, though, is what you find is that these great creators are also some of the biggest consumers of culture. Over and over again in these interviews, I found that these creatives were highly specialized consumers. They consumed everything. I talked to writers who read every single book in the library. I talked to musicians who spent their entire childhood listening to music. You find that consumption is highly correlated to creativity. Ted Sarandos told me that this experience as a clerk was like film school and MBA all wrapped up into one. J.K. Rowling famously had these parents who were always fighting, so she would go into her bedroom, close the door, and just read book after book after book. When she was asked by the New York Times, how do you become a great writer, she said, the most important thing you can do is to read. So consumption was a very strong pattern in my research. But why? Why would consumption be that? Because consumption is not productive, right? So why would consumption be so important? So I'm going to tell another story. And this time, I'm going to use myself as the protagonist. But I'm going to use myself in 20 years. So this is what I look like in 20 years. I think I aged pretty well. And for some reason, I'm reading a paper newspaper. It's very bizarre. Um, and I'm going through this paper newspaper, and I come across this thing. It's called a crossword puzzle. Is anyone here a crossword puzzler? OK, back of the room for some reason. Interesting. This is all Sudoku people over here. And what's interesting about crossword puzzles is they're actually used in a lot of the studies around creativity. And the reason why is that there's two different ways you can solve a crossword puzzle. The first way is that sometimes when you're solving a crossword puzzle, you solve it through logical processing, where it's like letter by letter. You're like, OK, that's a G. That's an R. I don't know what those are. That's N. Oh, it's green. I solved it. I'm brilliant. And this type of logical processing is what happens in the left hemisphere of our brain. So it's kind of cliche when you write a book on creativity to talk about left brain and right brain, but it's actually like really important. So here's like the quick, quick 101. So your left brain is where you store the dominant meanings of words or concepts. So think about like definition one in the dictionary. That's in your left hemisphere of your brain. Or like the key concepts, for example. So if I asked you what color is the sky, your left brain would be like, it's blue. 
obviously. It's also where you do logical processing. So when you're solving a math problem, for example, it's all in your left hemisphere. And it's all very conscious. You're working through it. You know that you're doing long division. You're aware of what's going on. But then sometimes you solve crossword puzzles a different way. Sometimes you're looking at it and you're like, oh, it's green. I'm brilliant. I should get promoted. Wow, look at me. Sometimes you experience sudden insight. And what's interesting is that those sudden insights that you experience when solving a word puzzle are actually the same thing from a biological perspective as a creative genius having a light bulb moment or having an aha. So what scientists do when they want to study creativity is they put people in an MRI machine, they put a visor on them, and they show them different puzzles. And then they ask, hey, how did you solve that? Was it logical processing or sudden insight? and they compare the brain scans between the two. So Dr. Edward Bowden is one of the big persons in this field, and I interviewed him for the book, and what he told me that I thought was really interesting, sort of the punchline of his quote, is that aha moments are a normal cognitive process, but they have a surprising result. They're a normal cognitive process, but they have a surprising result. Let me explain. So sudden insight happens in the right hemisphere of our brain. This is where we store like metaphors or puns, definition two and three in the dictionary, sort of more distant concepts. It's also where we do this sort of sudden insight processing, which is all subconscious. So think about when you hear a stand-up comedian, you're not like, why is it funny? You just get the joke. Unless it's Adam Sandler, then you don't get the joke. <laughs> Another way to think about this is, imagine I asked you to visualize a worm your left hemisphere would be like, this is a worm, with the weird face and all. Your right hemisphere would think of distant related concepts, like a bookworm, or gummy worms, or those songs you can't stop thinking about. Earworms, yes. <laughs> Very catchy. And the thing that's important, though, is that these aha moments, well, they're actually not special. They're simply subconscious. See, I think the best metaphor for this is think about your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere as being like that quiet lab partner in college and your loud lab partner. Your left hemisphere, you know, he's like captain of the lacrosse team, he's kind of smart, but he talks too much. And in lab, he's like, okay, we're gonna do this, and then this, and then this, and look, we solved the puzzle, good job team. And you're like, why is everything a team? And your right hemisphere is that quiet lab partner who's sort of working on it, and only once they get the answer do they go, hey, I got the answer. And if your left hemisphere is too loud, you can't actually hear what your right hemisphere is doing. So this is why we experience aha moments like in the shower, for example. These are moments when your left hemisphere is kind of like shut up. So there's three ways we experience aha moments. The first one is what I call shower moments. And this is like when you're on a run or on your commute or in the shower. It's not that your shower is inspiring although that tile work is really nice. Instead, what it is is that those are moments when your left hemisphere is tuned down. It's the same reason why we talk about drugs and alcohol being tied to creativity. These are all things that suppress your left hemisphere. So like, don't do drugs, just like go on a run. The other way that we experience aha moments is through combination. So this is when you connect two distant ideas together and that connection's very powerful, so you go, oh, I got it. The third way is through what scientists call a trigger moment. So this is when you're like in the mall, and you're like walking, and there's a sign over here that says the word green, and you get to here and you're like, oh, that crossword puzzle, the answer was green, how did I do that? And you just keep walking, never realizing you walked by a sign. So those trigger moments will also cause aha moments to happen. So okay. Other than walking in the mall, other than taking more showers, how can we make these aha moments happen? Well, there's a quote that Dr. Bowden gave me that I think is really, really important. In the book, I have it in there twice, right after each other, and I bolded it the second time, and my copy editor said, you cannot do that, and I responded in Microsoft Word, yes, I can, and she said, no, you cannot, and I said, yes, I can, and it's in there twice, so I won. <laughs> and the quote, is that you can't have insights about things you don't know anything about. 
you can't have insights about things you don't know anything about. Paul McCartney grew up in a musical household surrounded by musical parents. He literally played in a cover band for years. So yeah, he dreams about music and you don't. J.K. Rowling spent her entire childhood in a book, so she dreams up characters and plot ideas and you don't. But they don't dream about new architecture proposals. <laughs> Your right hemisphere is amazingly good at connecting distant ideas together but you need to give it the wrong ingredients to do it. And I found this over and over again in my interviews. So I interviewed this really eclectic set of characters, so like Kenya Barris, the creator of Blackish, Nina Jacobson, who's the producer behind, Crazy Rich Asians, Hunger Games, People vs. O.J. Simpson, Casey Neistat, the YouTuber. And over and over again, I found that consumption was a huge part of their creativity story. But what was interesting is it didn't just happen in childhood. So I was interviewing Ted Sarandos in his like private office, and this is a guy who has like a private plane, like he's like a busy guy, and I'm a really ditzy interviewer, and so I'm like sitting there, this is how I sit, it's very strange, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, but like how much TV do you watch these days? And he's like, you know, three to four hours a day, and I was like, what? You have a private plane. He's like, three to four hours a day. I was like, oh, and I found one of the things that was super interesting was that these great creatives, they keep spending time consuming well throughout their career. I found it was typically three to four hours a day, about 20% of their waking hours, consuming highly niche content in their space. And I call this the 20% principle. I think it's so important because one of the things that we do, oftentimes we think that consumption doesn't really matter. Right? We're waiting for ideas. But these great creators know that what goes in is what comes out. If you want to have more ideas, consuming is incredibly important. So two things I want you guys to take away from the first half of this talk. One, you have to block out more time in your day for consumption. If you want to understand the trends that are out there, right, you have to go out and see what's out there. Right? I want you reading those magazines about the newest trends and I want the newest designs and all that stuff. You need to be very well versed in your niche if you want to be able to have new ideas. And the second action is you have to create time for silence. We live in a world where you're constantly on your phone, there's constantly people yelling, there's all this stuff going on, but silence is hugely important in the creative process. Bill Gates spends a week a year in a cabin by himself. This is like the world's now third or fourth or fifth, depending on the week, richest man, right? He spends a week a year by himself in a cabin. All of these creators I interviewed had some sort of meditative-like practice. It wasn't usually meditation, but it could be running, it could be, for example, physical fitness, something that gave them the time to actually hear what the right hemisphere has been working on. Now, I have a but. Is anyone here from New Jersey? All right, hey, I'm from New Jersey too. Um, now, us New Jerseyans, you might not know this about us, but we're kind of cynical. It's because of all the smog. And <laughs> the New Jerseyans are sitting here and they're going, okay, but Alan, I watch three to four hours of TV a day. <laughs> like, I'm not creating great screenplays. Like, I'm in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and this is true. According to the Department of Labor, the average American watches three hours of TV every day. That's crazy. So why aren't we all creating great screenplays? Well, it turns out it's not just how much you consume, but it's also how you consume it. So I want to talk about how to consume content. But before I do that, I want to back up. When we started, I said that creativity is kind of hard to figure out, right? You know it when you see it, like Jackson Pollock, like that's creative, but my drawings, not so much. So sociologists actually have a really cool definition for creativity. And it's the ability to create things that are both novel and valuable. Novel and valuable. And the and is really important. Because if I just wanted to create something novel, well, like, I went to Microsoft Paint, and I created this. <laughs> it's certainly novel. It's definitely not valuable. And it's definitely not creative to anyone other than my mother. Now, on the other hand, if I just created something valuable, and by the way, the example I'm about to show you is true. 
I recently discovered how to do conditional color formatting in Excel. <laughs> Crazy! <laughs> definitely valuable, definitely not novel, definitely not creative. So when we talk about creativity, by the way, I'm still mind blown that no one ever showed me that. I'm like, oh, I really thought they were just coloring it by hand. So when you talk about creativity, what we're really talking about is the ability to create things that are both novel and valuable. But this leads to a problem. Value is a social phenomenon. What we agree is valuable are things we all say are valuable, like money, right? Things are valuable because we say they're valuable. So if we want to understand this, we have to dive more into human behavior. What drives us to like certain things but dislike other things? Well, we have a term for things we call, we have a term for things that are both novel and valuable. We call them hits. And I don't mean hits in like just the Taylor Swift sense, although those count. I also mean hits like a hit paper academic conference, a hit building design. A hit is when something in a group, big or small, is deemed both to be novel and valuable. And so the study of hits and trends is actually very useful when the study of creativity. So I want to talk about some hits, but before I do that, is anyone here named Lisa? Just raise your hand. Okay, we got like one Lisa. Lisa, I love you. Do not cheat on this exercise. Poker face. Okay, I want the rest of you to name some famous Lisas, and Lisa Simpson's not a person. So just yell them out. Oh, that's a good one. Mona Lisa kind of counts. Lisa Kudrow, Lisa Frank, Lisa Marie Presley, Lisa Bonet, these are good. So you guys get 75% credit. You got three of the four most common answers. That's a C, but it's okay. Um, now, what do all of these Lisas have in common? And don't say that they're women, don't say that they're famous, don't say that they're in entertainment. Don't say that their name's Lisa. There's always some guy, it's always a guy. They were all born in the 1960s. Lisa was the number one name for every single year in the 1960s except for two. It was the hit name of the entire decade. But by 2016, Lisa had fallen, according to the Social Security Administration, to the 833rd most popular name, and there were only 342 baby girls in the entire country named Lisa. The New York Times published an article titled, Where Have All the Lisas Gone? <laughs> this is a chart. I love you, Lisa, thank you. <sighs> so what's interesting to me about hits and interesting to me about trends is that there's a rise and a fall. Things come in style and they come out of style. So if we want to understand creativity, we have to also understand why do things rise and fall in popularity. And so we're gonna start with the rise. So we're gonna go on a trip. We're gonna go to China. I hope you have lots of airline miles. And we're going to take part in a famous psychology study. And if anyone here speaks Mandarin, just no helping here. Okay. So this is from a famous psychology study, and I want you all to look at this Chinese character, and I want you to decide whether or not you think it has a positive meaning or a negative meaning. Okay, positive meaning or a negative meaning? Okay, raise your hand if you think it has a positive meaning. Whoa, San Diego, 85%. Negative meaning, like 15%, decent math. So, I have something to tell you. I tricked you, it means nothing. So this is from a famous psychology study done by a guy named Robert Zion, who's one of the sort of grandfathers of human behavior. And he had this question, which is what drives us to like certain things and dislike other things? What drives us to think some things are positive and some things are negative? And he had this hypothesis that the more familiar we are with something, the more we like or dislike it. And so he took a bunch of made up Chinese characters and showed it to different groups of people different amounts of time. He showed it to some people five times, some people 15 times, some people 25 times. 
Then he asked them, do you think it's positive or negative, and how much do you like it? And what he found was that merely seeing something more made people like it more. And he named this the mere exposure effect, because he's not a good marketer. The mere exposure effect, which is that the more you are exposed to something, the more you like it. And this has huge implications for us, right? This is why we use logos and brand colors. Familiarity is a huge part of what we do. So as humans, we crave the familiar. And the reason why is actually kind of interesting. See, the thing is that our brain, one of its main tasks is to keep us safe. And we've been wired to figure out that actually things that are unfamiliar, they could harm us. So think about it for some reason, just go with me on this. You broke into your neighbor's house, and I don't know why, and you go into the basement and you see this creepy door. You're like, I'm not going in this door. Like, I could die. I don't have life insurance. This is a terrible idea. But now imagine that same exact door, looking the same exact level of creepy. Imagine that was in your grandmother's house, and it's where she stored the wine. You're like, I love that door. That's a great door. I'm going to go in that door all day. So even though it's the same door, how familiar it is changes our perception of it. So one of our tasks as creatives is how do we create things that are familiar? And this is actually another way that consumption plays a big role in our process. Because to know what will be familiar, we have to know what's already out there. Okay, that makes sense. But if the more we see something, the more we like it, well then why aren't we all living in Lisa land? Right, why isn't everyone named Lisa, not just her? Why am I named Lisa? Lisa should just keep going up and up in popularity. So eventually, ideas fall from favor. So to figure out why this is, we're gonna go to another study from Robert Zionk, and he's not gonna trick you again. This time, he said, okay, what if we took something more complex than a Chinese character? What if we took a piece of abstract art? And rather than just flash it in front of someone, what if we showed it to them and told them to study it? to really think about it. But then he did the same thing. He showed it to some people once, some people three times, some people six times. And this time, he actually found something different. This time what he found was that at first, the more you saw it, the more you liked it, but then you start to get bored. Then you actually start pursuing novelty. You want something new and different. You're like, I don't want to see this painting again. And then the more you saw it, the less you liked it. So as humans, it turns out, we also have this other urge. We also pursue things that are novel. And the reason why is pretty simple. We were at one point hunter-gatherers, and we were looking for the next meal, the next source of food, of calories. If you were in a field and you saw some like weird, tiny strawberry, you're like, I'm going to eat that. Right? That's calories. That's good. But this is a contradiction. So. We seek out the familiar because it makes us feel safe, but we also seek out the novel for potential reward? That's confusing. That doesn't make sense. Well, this is actually our brain's really elegant way of balancing risk and reward. We actually don't like things that are too new. So like imagine you saw this weird red pitted olive thing. You're like, I'm not eating that. That's crazy. And that's good because that's a you seed. It will kill you. So what you find is that actually the things we like as humans are a blend of the familiar and the novel. And scientists have found this finding, and they call it the inverted U-shaped relationship between familiarity and preference, which is a terrible title for a book, so I rebranded it, The Creative Curve. And what it is is that when you chart out the familiarity of something and how much people like it, you find at an individual level a group level and a population level, you find there's this upside down U-shape. Where at first when you see something or hear something or experience it, you're like, this is not that good. Like that first time you heard that new Drake song, you're like, eh, this is fine, right? But the third time you're like, oh, this is pretty good. And then the tenth time you're like, I don't ever want to hear this song again, but I like it. And the fifteenth time you're like, please stop playing this song. And so I break this up into five stages, and I think this is really, really important when it comes to creativity. 
The first stage is when things are too new. When things are just adopted by those early adopters, you know, the hipsters, the fashionistas. And you can see a really good example of this if you ever watch Men's Fashion Week. So this year in Men's Fashion Week, the big trend was unstructured full-length coats, right? And you're all like, this is kind of weird. I'm not going to wear that. That's crazy. But in three years, you're all going to wear that because that's how trends work. So at first, things seem a little bit too much, right? They're kind of odd. They're kind of off-putting. But then we actually hit the most important stage. So if you've been tweeting for the last 40 minutes, this is the time to pay attention. This is the most important thing. There's a stage where ideas are just that right blend of familiar and novel where they capture our attention. They're familiar enough to be safe, but they're still novel enough to be interesting. Those are the ideas that take off. So let me give you an example. If you've been on Facebook any time the last six months, you've probably seen that viral video of all these people waiting in line to get what looks like ice cream, but it's actually not ice cream, it's actually scoopable cookie dough. And there's this big trend now going on in America where there's all these scoopable cookie dough shops popping up. They're all over New York, they just opened one in DC where I live right now, there's one in Baltimore. This is a trend which right now, it's familiar, right? It's ice cream, but it's cookie dough, it's novel, and it's interesting. It's something where if you open one up, it's probably gonna do well. But eventually it's gonna become like Pinkberry and become cliche, we'll get over it. Because eventually ideas reach this point of cliche. And so to really illustrate this point, I wanna use a mid-2000s reality TV show reference. Are you ready for it? Okay. His name's John, her name's Kate, they have eight children. Okay, yeah. And John and Kate plus eight, not only was a mediocre TV show, but the new season in 2009 also reached the point of cliche for a certain clothing brand because John Goslin started wearing Ed Hardy. And Ed Hardy that year peaked at $900 million in sales and tumbled to now it does $25 million a year. Don Ed Hardy, the original tattoo artist, he was like, it's this guy's fault. All of a sudden it was all over People Magazine and Us Weekly and all this stuff. Like Beyonce used to wear Ed Hardy. Like it was cool, but eventually it became cliche. Then ideas reach what I call follow on failure. This is where a lot of big organizations create ideas. You create an idea, a proposal, whatever it is, and it's based on some of the trends you're seeing, but it's a little bit too late. So by the time it actually comes to market, by the time you actually get that project done, it's gonna seem trite and over. Like a great example of this right now is don't create another like rosé product, right? <laughs> like there's canned rosé, frozen rosé, rosé smoothies, slushies, protein drinks, whatever. Like just stop with the rosé. By the time you create your rosé product, it's gonna be done. The last stage is when things are out of date. This is when things are already, they're over, right? Don't start collecting Beanie Babies, right? Don't do it, don't open a disco shop, like don't be that person. So the task for us as marketers, as creatives, as people trying to generate business, is how do we create ideas, products, proposals, projects that are in that sweet spot of familiarity and novelty, that are familiar enough to be safe, but novel enough to be interesting and new. Right, think about it. We think so often that creativity is about radical newness. But the reality is far from it. Star Wars, Western in space. Harry Potter, the most basic orphan story of all time, but there's wizards. Um, Apple, for example, people are like, well, what about Steve Jobs? Well, what about him? The iPod was a better MP3 player. The iPhone was an iPod with a phone. The iPad was an iPhone without a phone? What you find when you start looking at creativity is that actually the products and the ideas that take off in our culture are not the ideas that are radically new. They're the ideas that have one foot in the familiar and one foot in the novel. And so I wanna end with a story about how you can actually learn to create this. And it goes to that question of how do you consume? Right, we talked about how much to consume, but how do you actually consume? And so to tell this final story, I'm gonna use a gentleman named Ben Franklin. And I'm gonna use Ben Franklin when he was 18 years old. He was once young, you may not have known this. He wasn't born with the wig. 
And Ben Franklin is known as this great American writer. He wrote all these founding documents. He wrote this autobiography you were probably forced to read. But it, in his autobiography, he describes how at age 18, his father shamed him. His father told him, Ben, you're not a very good writer. There's a lot of very judgmental dads in this presentation. <laughs> ben, you're not a very good writer. And Ben was like, oh my god, I don't want to let my dad down. And so he decided that he was going to become a great writer. And he describes in his autobiography how he went about doing this. And so what he did is he took a copy of The Spectator, which was kind of like The Economist of the day, like it was like vaguely intellectual and global. And he took a copy of The Spectator and he found an article he really liked and he decided to imitate it. So he took the article and he started outlining it. What did the article start with? Did it start with a story, a quote, a thesis, a supporting detail? How did they build the argument? And from that, he then put it on his desk, went away, came back a week later, and he rewrote the article based on the outline. He then made it even harder for himself. He cut up the outline, he shuffled it around, he left, he came back a week later, and then he rewrote the article. Because what he realized was that his job was not to recreate how you write a persuasive article. His job was to create his own arguments using these baselines and these formats that we like, that we're used to. What you find when it comes to creativity is that imitation is actually a very common part of the story of creative geniuses. They're not afraid to stand on the shoulders of them who've come before them. I call this the Franklin Method. It's this idea, it's a careful observation recreation of the structure of successful creative work. It's not plagiarism. It's not about copying the actual content. What it's about is figuring out what are those familiar structures, those baselines, those things that we can then use to add our own novel twist. So let me give you an example of why this works. So sociologists are really fascinated by something that seems really silly, which is memes. So sociologists think memes are really, really interesting because they're an example of creativity at a very large scale. Like people all over the world create memes. And if you're not familiar with memes, they're silly images with text, and they have sort of a standard format. So this is the Grumpy Cat meme, and I interviewed Grumpy Cat's manager. He has a manager. Um, Grumpy Cat's manager, by the way, also manages Keyboard Cat, Nyan Cat, and some other cat. And Grumpy Cat's manager makes like a lot of money, so no judgment. And what's interesting about memes is that they have a predefined structure. You know if you want to create your own meme, how to do it. So in the Grumpy Cat meme, the first line is something kind of straightforward, kind of neutral. Then there's a picture of a grumpy cat. And the second line is something grumpy. So if we, for example, want to create our own meme here, well, OK, well, I love typos. They make marketers cry. <laughs> it's really easy to create your own meme because the structure, that familiar baseline, is inherent. Your job is just to add that own little novel twist. Alexis Ohanian, the founder of Reddit, where a lot of memes start, what he told me is that what makes a meme funny is that 10% twist, right? It's easier to remix an existing meme than it is to create a new one. Memes lower the bar to creativity, and there's this little microcosm of the creative process because they have all that stuff built in. It's easy to imitate when you know the baseline. And you find that these great creators, they're very aware of this. Like, I hate quoting Kanye West, but I'm about to do it. Um, Kanye recently tweeted out, he said, too much emphasis is put on originality. Feel free to take ideas and update them at your will. All great artists take an update. Which kind of ironically is actually stealing a Steve Jobs quote, which is stealing a Pablo Picasso quote, where Steve Jobs said, Picasso had a saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. And we, that means at Apple, have always been shameless about stealing great ideas. What you find when you look at the stories of creative achievers, it's not the story of radical newness. It's a story of finding what is that level of familiarity that will get your audience to know what they need to know, and adding your own novel twist so that you can actually create an idea that sticks. So 
The third and final action that I want to leave you with is that your job as someone who wants to create new campaigns, new products, new messages, new projects, well, your job is to create something in that sweet spot of the creative curve, something that's both familiar and novel. And one of the key ways to do that is to imitate the structure of other successful works. Kurt Vonnegut, when he tried to get his master's thesis, he didn't finish, but when he tried to get his master's thesis, what he did, his project was he took all these great American novels and he mapped out the story arcs. And he found there was four recurring story arcs that appeared over and over again. Stephen King talks about when he wanted to learn how to become a great writer, he rewrote The Great Gatsby by hand to learn how to tell stories. So what these great creatives do is either physically or mentally, they engage in what Cal Newport calls copy work, where they're learning the structure of these things, right? They're not recreating the wheel. No one wants to watch a nine-hour movie with no protagonist, right? We want to watch a movie that has a hero, that has a villain, that has dramatic tension. And we all have those story arcs. Those already exist. So I want to end with a question. And the question is, are you your own worst enemy? When it comes to creativity, we give ourselves a lot of excuses. And they usually come in two flavors. Either, well, creativity is just a lot of hard work and I don't have time for that. Or, creativity is that thing that certain lucky people have. They won the genetic lottery. You know, Mozart just popped out playing the piano. The science shows us this is not true. What the science shows is that everyone has the same creative potential, but there's a gap between creative potential and creative achievement. And you can learn how to close this gap for yourself, for your teams, for your companies, but it's up to you. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to stop before you start? Thank you guys so much.